Okay, folks, we're recording. I'm Tom Kimmel, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Although I have given the story within the Pearl Harbor story, the presentation a hundred times, never to the West Point Society before. So I am uh, particularly interested in this opportunity. Thank you again for it. Stay with me, if you will, and I promise you an investigation to determine the true cause, the real reason for the success of the Japanese attack. I promise you some facts you have never heard before, some free stuff, and hopefully some fun along the way. After all, it's my job to talk today. It's your job to listen. Should you finish before I do, then uh, God bless you. <laughs> but the first thing I want to do is to fix responsibility. I want to cut to the chase. I want to be very clear. I don't want any mistakes made. What we are here to do today is to fix responsibility for the success of the Pearl Harbor attack. To do so, I have found this exercise to be useful. Bear with me. Don and Tim clearly are responsible for having me here today. In the same sense that Kimmel and Short, that would be Admiral Kimmel and General Short, were responsible in Hawaii. In the sense that Don and Kim had to properly respond to the information that they had. We continue. Don and Kim are also accountable for having me here today. Just like Kimmel and Short, they have to account for everything they did and did not do in getting me here today. But what have we learned so far? I submit not much. What we really want to know, are Kim and Don blamable for having me here today? And for you to decide, ladies and gentlemen, should they be punished for having me here today? Okay, why am I here? Who am I? This represents my first ship out of the Naval Academy, my second ship. My third ship, this represents my 25 years in the FBI, another year and a half on contract. And incidentally, Dave Binney, West Point, 1964, now deceased, was my direct boss at one point when he was the deputy director of the FBI. Okay, here's why I'm here. There's a story within the Pearl Harbor story. It's the story of a nation under attack for five years, to be sure. But it's also the story of two men under attack for 75 years, conscientious men of probity who have been humiliated, disgraced, and scapegoated for 75 years, one of which is my grandfather. I am his eldest grandson. There's a story within the Pearl Harbor story. This is part of the story. Left to right. That's my dad. Naval Academy, class of 1936. That's my grandfather, class of 1904. That's my uncle, my dad's older brother, class of 1935. That's my great uncle, West Point, class of 1913, and that's my great-grandfather, West Point, class of 57. That's uh, 1857, and as I am sure you have already figured out, perilously close to the Civil War. Indeed, Marius Manning Kimmel fought the first battle of Bull Run or Manassas, if you prefer, for the United States Army, but he was from Kentucky. And after the battle, he resigned his commission 
and went back to Kentucky to consider his options. He opted to fight the rest of the war for the Confederate States Army. And fight he did. He fought at Vicksburg, Holly Springs, Corinth, Pea Ridge, with Magruder's Raiders, and a host of lesser engagements. And miraculously survived the war. Or we would not be having this conversation today. Admiral Kimmel had three sons. The oldest boy, he was killed in the war. My dad, who barely escaped being killed in the war. And a much younger son, Ned Kimmel, who also fought on Navy ships, the Vixen and the Ranger. But he strayed badly and went to the Ivy League, graduating from Princeton and Harvard Law School. He was largely responsible for obtaining legislation in 2000 in which the Congress recommended that the President nominate Rear Admiral Kimmel and Major General Short posthumously to their highest held temporary ranks in World War II of Admiral and Lieutenant General respectively on the retired list. In accordance with the Officer Personnel Act of 1947, as they are the only two flag and general officers otherwise qualified under the act not to be advanced. In other words, the only two officers officially punished for the success of the Japanese attack. Ladies and gentlemen, this is perhaps my favorite picture of all time. And the reason for it is simple because I know how difficult it was for the Time Life photographers who took this photograph in 1991 to get both my dad and my uncle smiling at the same time like they are here. It's also probably the most important slide that I will show you today. Here's why. In 1984, the then president of the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association, Alex Cobb, summoned my father and uncle to a meeting in Liberty, New York, where President Cobb asked my dad and uncle to assist the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association rehabilitate the honor and reputation of their commanders. My dad and my uncle looked at each other and thought, my goodness, if the men who suffered the most from the Pearl Harbor attack want our assistance, who are we not to give our all in support? which is also why I'm here right now, I'm merely about my father's work. But the most important thing to take away with you today is that the modern initiative to posthumously advance Kimmel and Short on the retired list began with the Pearl Harbor Survivors Association and not with the Kimmel family. Okay, it's impossible to have an understanding of the Pearl Harbor attack without knowing something about magic. So here we go. Magic was the term coined by Admiral Anderson, then Director of Naval Intelligence, to refer to any decrypted Japanese code message. It was a code word for the secret American decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications, which prior to the attack gave indications of the time, place, reason, and the sea plan to cover the attack. Hawaii, of course, had no magic. The man President Roosevelt designated in charge of internal security for the United States, that would be J. Edgar Hoover, my former boss, he had no magic. And the man President Roosevelt designated in charge of external security for the United States, Colonel William Wild Bill Donovan, the coordinator of information, he had no magic either. But we now know that not only did Stalin have access to magic, but Secretary of State Cordell Hull's famous November 26, 1941 diplomatic note to the Japanese, the document that touched the button that started the war, was written in the first two iterations by Soviet spy Harry Dexter White. Why do I say that? I say that because of Robert Lipka, Vasily Matroykin, Anthony Blunt, 
Guy Liddell, and Lawrence Safford, all of which is the subject of another presentation and another day. This matter of magic is so important to the Pearl Harbor story, not just because this critical information was denied to Kimmel and Short, though that alone would have been enough, but because the way it was denied affirmatively misled them. I can think of no one better to explain the matter than Admiral Kimmel's counsel, Ed Hannafy. On Oahu, the naval and army commanders heard nothing of the Japanese reactions to the embargoes. They were advised that although the bans were enforced, no hostile reaction by Japan was expected. Kimmel, Hannafy believes, was badly served. Pearl Harbor did not have the purple machine, which was necessary to intercept the critical Japanese diplomatic messages. As a consequence, Kimmel was dependent upon Washington to get him that type of intelligence. From time to time, he received messages indicating that he was getting some of the intercepts. He expected that he would get all of that type of information which affected his disposition. He had specifically asked for intelligence information that bore upon his problem of defense of the fleet and the base, and he'd been assured he was going to get it. So the absence of the machine and the sporadic intercepts which he got lulled him into a false security in the belief he was getting the intelligence which he needed, and he wasn't. Now it's time to uh, hear from the old man himself. We needed one thing, which our own resources could not make available to us. That vital need was the information available in Washington from the intercepted dispatches, which told when and where Japan would probably strike. I did not get this information. Oh, yes, and uh, one more thing. Days before the surprise attack. I cannot understand now. I have never understood. I may never understand why I was deprived of the information available in the Navy Department in Washington on Saturday night and Sunday morning. Okay, folks, here's the real story within the Pearl Harbor story. Nine days after the attack, President Roosevelt selected a sitting Supreme Court Associate Justice, Owen Roberts, to investigate the Army and Navy only, and then only, in Hawaii. Ten days after the attack, Kimmel and Short were fired and replaced. Eleven days after the attack, Supreme Court Associate Justice Roberts began his deliberations. His commission investigated for 36 days. 47 days after the attack, Chairman Roberts submitted his report to President Roosevelt, finding Kimmel and Short solely blamable for the success of the Japanese attack and derelict in their duty. President Roosevelt signed the report unredacted and gave it to the press immediately. End of the story. End of the story, soup to nuts. And it would have been the end of the story, but for one man. Captain Lawrence Safford, the head of Naval Communications Intelligence. Indeed, the revered father of Naval Communications Intelligence. Two years after the Roberts Commission, Captain Safford, at great personal risk to himself, went to visit Admiral Kimmel in Bronxville, New York, where he was living in disgrace, a beaten man. Captain Safford asked Admiral Kimmel, Admiral, did you have in Hawaii, prior to the attack, the same information we had in the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, D.C.? from the secret decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications in a program we called MAGIC that gave us indications prior to the attack of the time, place, reason, and deceit plan to cover the attack. 
Admiral Kimmel, stunned, looked at Captain Safford and said, what are you talking about, Captain? What is magic? Safford explained. Admiral Kimmel, that very day, turned into a fighting tiger. He got legal representation out of Boston. Kimmel's counsel, Ed Hanafy, took Safford's information and actually wrote the enabling legislation, which he took to the Naval Affairs Committee. The committee was so impressed, they took it to the full Congress, which passed a law ordering the Army and the Navy to conduct further investigations, or there would have been no further investigation 47 days after the Pearl Harbor attack. So here's the real story within the Pearl Harbor story. One man's, Admiral Kimmel's, determination to provide the American public with all the facts about the Pearl Harbor attack. This slide, this chronology, indeed just the first listed investigation in the chronology, tells you all you really need to know. Consider, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox wrote that, and I quote now, Neither Short nor Kimmel at the time of the attack had any knowledge of the plain intimations of some surprise move made clear in Washington through the interception of Japanese instructions to Nomura, in which a surprise move of some kind was clearly indicated by the insistence upon the precise time of Nomura's reply to Secretary of State Cordell Hull at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Sunday afternoon. A general warning had been sent out from the Navy Department on November 27th to Admiral Kimmel. General Short told me that a message of warning sent from the War Department on Saturday night at midnight before the attack failed to reach him until four or five hours after the attack had been made. He continued, of course, the best means of defense against air attack consists of fighter planes. Lack of an adequate number of this type of aircraft available to the Army for the defense of the island is due to the diversion of this type before the outbreak of the war to the British, the Chinese, the Dutch, and the Russians. Knox's report was known to Chairman Roberts and his commission, but was not revealed to Kimmel and Short. Investigation number two, here's the dark heart of the Roberts matter. The Washington High Command falsely, falsely testified to the Roberts Commission that Kimmel and Short had the same magic information in Hawaii as they had in Washington, D.C. This false information was calculated to do and did Kimmel and Short irreparable prejudice. The Washington High Command had an obligation as officers and decent human beings to rectify the prejudice to Kimmel and Short from such deplorable misinformation. They did not do so. Investigation number three, Captain Safford revealed magic to Admiral Hart. Investigation number four, Admiral Kimmel re revealed magic to the Army Pearl Harbor Board after Chief of Staff Marshall had committed perjury and ordered subordinates to do the same. Marshall was severely criticized by the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Investigation number five, the Naval Court of Inquiry virtually exonerated Admiral Kimmel and criticized Admiral Kimmel's only uniformed boss in the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stark. Investigations six, seven, and eight, the Clark, Clausen, and Hewitt investigations tinkered at the margins. Investigation number nine, the Joint Congressional Committee found no dereliction of duty. Investigation number 10, at least that's what I call it, the Army Board for Correction of Military Records found injustice to General Short and recommended advancement posthumously for General Short as a remedy. But they were overruled by higher authority. For this group, there'll be more on that in a moment. But first, investigation number 11, the Dorn Report recognized the responsibility for the success of the Japanese attack should, should be broadly shared, but it has not been. 
It is unconscionable to continue to punish Kimmel and Short once this concept has been accepted. Advancing Kimmel and Short does not diminish their command accountability and responsibility any more than ignoring the command accountability and responsibility of Kimmel and Short's superiors diminish theirs. Investigations 12, 13, and 14 suffice it to say the matter is ongoing as we speak. General Short's son, Colonel Walter Dean Short, West Point, 1942, appealed to the Army Board for Correction of Military Records in 1991, which found injustice to General Short and recommended the relief sought, advancement of General Short on the retired list. But Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army, John W. Matthews, adopted the Army Board for Correction of Military Records minority recommendation without, without an alternative finding of facts. Matthews wrote, advancement of short would reverse the course of history as adjudged by his superiors who were in a better position to evaluate the Pearl Harbor disaster. Well, I can only echo the words of former director of the Office of Naval Intelligence, Admiral Tom Brooks, when he wrote that Short's superiors committed perjury, suborned perjury, destroyed evidence, and intimidated witnesses. So much for Short's superiors being in a better position to evaluate his performance. Graduation exercises, West Point, 2001. Unfortunately, this didn't come to my attention for hmm, 13 years. When I actually listened to Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz address to the United States Military Graduation Class of 2001, I was amazed at several of his statements, not the least of which is this one. Intelligence reports were warned of a surprise move in any direction, but this made the Army commander in Honolulu think of sabotage, not attack. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, from the 20th of October, 1941, until the attack on December 7th, General Short received from General Marshall only one message relating to the extremely important question of war with Japan. And this is it. I have a question for you. What is frequently claimed as General Short's number one error, certainly by the former Deputy Secretary of Defense? Well, the answer lining up his aircraft wingtip to wingtip, making them easy targets for the enemy. Well, okay, but consider this. Marshall's November 27, 1941 message to Short, arguably the worst worded, vitally important military message ever sent, ordered Short to report measures taken. He did, the next day, November 28, 1941. His message, report department alerted to prevent sabotage. Liaison with the Navy, reference your radio 472 of 27 November, 1941, short. After Marshall's November 27, 1941 message to short, Again, arguably the worst worded, vitally important military message ever sent, Marshall's intelligence chief, Sherman Miles, West Point, 1905, the same day sent short and no one else this dis dispatch. Japanese negoti negotiations have come to a practical stalemate. Hostilities may ensue. Subversive activities may be expected. 
On November 28, 1941, Marshall's adjutant, Major General Emery Adams, incidentally, Jr., was USMA 1940, sent short and no one else this dispatch. It is desired that, a, that all additional measures necessary by, be initiated by you immediately to provide the following. Protection of your personnel against subversive propaganda, protection of all activities against espionage, and protection against sabotage. By December 5th, submit reports of all steps initiated by you to comply with these instructions. We're not finished yet. On November 28, 1941, Marshall's adjutant sent another dispatch to Short and to no one else. Critical situation demands that all precautions be taken immediately against subversive activities. Also desire that you initiate forthwith all additional measures necessary to provide for protection of your establishment's property and equipment against sabotage protection of your personnel against subversive propaganda, protection of all activities against espionage. Protective measures should be confined to those essential to security, avoid unnecessary publicity and alarm. Ladies and gentlemen, that's three message, messages from Marshall's lieutenants ordering him to protect against sabotage. Short was told by Marshall and his lieutenants, therefore he's protecting against sabotage. Another question for you. What is frequently claimed as Short's second biggest error? The answer, not running his radar warning equipment 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, okay, but consider this. From an October 1941 budget report that Short presented to the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Supplemental estimates for funds submitted to the War Department Budget Advisory Committee in October 1941 with which to procure sufficient vacuum tubes to permit operation of air warning equipment on a basis of 24 hours daily were reduced to permit operation only two hours daily, five days a week, with the statement that the Signal Corps was carrying air warning plans to extremes that the United States was not threatened with attack. A little more on radar, this time from Navy uh, Captain Joe Tossig, who at the time uh, was an ensign on the Nevada. Captain Tossig on Pearl Harbor radar, I do not think it's strange that the so-called radar warning was ignored, for as Sir Winston might have put it, it had much to be ignored about. On 7 December 1941, this experimental equipment was extremely unreliable, mostly because it was, so to speak, false return prone. A flight of gulls, for example, could snafu the entire system, and anyone purporting to see a flight of bombers on an A-scope circa December 1941 was indeed a seer of great perception. One air aircraft made the same mess on the scope as 100, and any number of boats, ships, and seagulls could do the same thing. Ensign Tossig was awarded the Navy Cross and Purple Heart for his actions on the USS Nevada during the attack. Okay, now it gets interesting. Enter the head of Army counterintelligence in Washington, D.C., four days after the Pearl Harbor attack, as an, as an FBI informant. This information was red hot but it was not declassified until 1975, and the informant not revealed in 2000, until 2002. Ladies and gentlemen, if true, this information would have been the most relevant material testimony in the entire series of Pearl Harbor investigations. If confirmed, Kimmel and Short should not only have been blamed for the success of the Pearl Harbor attack and court-martialed, they should have been shot as testimony to its importance, this information was immediately sent by the FBI to President Roosevelt and a week later sent to Chairman Roberts and his commission. In pertinent part, FBI informant John Ter Bush Bissell the head of Army Counterintelligence in Washington, D.C., on December 7, 1941, 
today inform Special Agent George C. Burton in the strictest of confidence and with the statement that if it ever got out that he had disclosed this information, he would be fired. That about 10 days before the attack, Japanese intercepts were broken in Washington, D.C. These messages contained substantially the complete plans for the attack. They also contained a code word. A message was sent by Army Radio to Hawaii, setting forth this entire plan for the information of authorities in Hawaii. On Friday, December 5, 1941, the code words were intercepted, which indicated that the attack was to be on either Saturday or Sunday, and this information was sent to Hawaii. So, how did Chairman Roberts use, and more importantly, not use, John Kerr Bush Bissell's informant information? The Roberts Commission Chairman, Supreme Court Associate Justice Owen Roberts, interrogated General Short's Intelligence Chief, Colonel Kendall Fielder, thus. It has been reported to me, Chairman Roberts, that about 10 days before the attack, the code was intercepted, which could not be broken, but it was forwarded to Washington to be broken, and the War Department did break it and found it contained three important signal words which would direct the attack on Pearl Harbor, and that the War Department subsequently intercepted those three signal words and forwarded them to the military authorities here in Hawaii as an indication that the code had been followed and the attack was planned. <laughs> Of course, Fielder had no idea what Roberts was talking about and said so. So what did Roberts do next? He went after Fielder's assistant, G2 in Hawaii, George Bicknall. And he went after him thus. Roberts, I refer to the fact that some 10 days before December, it is supposed that a Japanese code message broken down in Washington gave certain keywords which would be flashed over the radio directing the attack on Pearl Harbor. Big Nell, obviously uh, not grasping what, what the question is, says yes. Then Roberts goes and says, and that, having broken that down, one of the military establishments in Washington caught over the radio three code words, keywords, and relayed them to you. When I say you, to the islands. Vic Nell, still bewildered, obviously, says, yes, do you know of any such story? And Vic Nell, finally coming to his senses, said, I never heard of such a thing. Never heard of it? No, sir. So what did Roberts do then? Well, he dropped the matter. And later, in 1946, keep in mind this interrogation of uh, Vic Nell and Fielder was in 1941, In 1946, Roberts, before the Joint Congressional Committee, under oath, lied to the Joint Congressional Committee about where he got the information to interrogate Fielder and Bicknell. Years later, that would be a little over three years later, at the Army Pearl Harbor Board, when Short finally found out about Roberts' interrogation of Fielder and Bicknell, he clearly smelled a rat. Of course, he did not know Roberts' information came from an FBI informant no less than the head of Army Counterintelligence in Washington, D.C., John Ter Bush Bissell. General Short, before the Army Pearl Harbor Board, the very fact that Chairman Roberts, the president of that board, had information pertaining to such a message and thought it worthwhile to bring it up to see whether he had it, indicates it must have been a message of importance. I think it's very important that the Army Pearl Harbor Board know to what Justice Roberts referred. General Russell, member of the Army Pearl Harbor Board, it indicates there was a search made by Justice Roberts for the existence of a fact, but it was a fruitless search. Now, sir, says Short, I don't agree with you. It indicated to me that Roberts knew what he was, what it was, and was trying to find out whether we did, whether we had gotten it, because there would be no purpose in Justice Roberts asking a question like that without he had some <coughs> information. 
General Russell, you were searching for the basis of Justice Roberts' question? Exactly. That is what I would like to know. What caused Justice Roberts to ask that question? When he found out that we did not know anything about it, he seemed perfectly satisfied to drop it. He did not give any information, and he never brought it up to me. And incidentally, he never brought it up to Admiral Kimmel either. General Grenard of the Army Pearl Harbor Board. It is my understanding that you are requesting something of the board? Sure. Yeah. I'm requesting the board obtain that message. <clears throat> but apparently the Army Pearl Harbor Board did not ask Roberts about the matter, and neither Roberts, J. Edgar Hoover, nor Colonel Bissell volunteered information to them or to any other Pearl Harbor investigation. Later, the Joint Congressional Committee specifically asked Roberts about the language he used to interrogate Fiedler and Bignell. Roberts said he did not recall where he got the language. Bissell, Bissell Hoover, and FBI agents Ladd and Burton held their silence. <sighs> they were not the only ones to remain silent. William F. Friedman's 1957 brochure was not made public by the National Security, Agents, Security Agency until 2015. He's the man credited with breaking for the Army Security Agency Japan's Purple Magic Code. His brochure is definitely worth a look. He wrote in 1957... After studying Tokyo Dispatch Number 83, that would be the bomb plot message, no military intelligence organization could fail to reach the deduction that it was to prepare the detailed plan for a surprise attack on the major units of the fleet moored there. Here, I think, is the kernel of the nut, the secret of why the United States was taken by surprise. I have underlined the phrase, no military intelligence organization, in the foregoing extract from Admiral Theobald's book, page 46, because I think that our military and naval intelligence organization had serious defects at that time, and I think they still do. He continued, I think that serious defects in our military and naval intelligence made it possible for the Japanese to take us by surprise at Pearl Harbor. A strong statement? Yes, but I think it is warranted. I think that Kimmel and Short were not as culpable as I first thought they were in 1941-42. The Washington authorities were culpable, too, maybe a lot more culpable than were these two officers. I think that Kimmel and Short should have been sent more information, even if they were sent only gists of magic, to let them evaluate for themselves the significance of what the Japanese were saying. General Miles, the head of Army intelligence says that the warning messages sent them were of far more importance than anything they could have got from magic. I don't agree. Today, in 1957, I think they, the Joint Congressional Committee minority, hit closer to the truth than the majority. I think Mr. Keith's additional views on the majority report make good sense. Kimmel and Short, he said, were not the sole culp culprits. culprits. I think that the intelligence services came off rather easily, too easily, in the fixing of responsibility and pointing out derelictions. <clears throat> On May 8, 1957, William Friedman wrote, Today, General Samford, West Point, 1928, the head of NSA, phoned me to say that he did not think it advisable to publish the brochure at all. I accepted his decision without question. Ladies and gentlemen, is it any wonder why General Samford did not want Friedman's brochure published or why the Army, NSA, waited so long to make it public? This was the highlight of the Joint Congressional Committee investigation. Commander Lester Scholes delivered the 13th part of the 14-part message by the Japanese responding to Cordell Hall's 
November 26, 1941, American Note, the document that the Army Pearl Harbor Board styled as the document that touched the button that started the war. Lester Scholes testified to the Joint Congressional Committee that when President Roosevelt read the 13th part of the 14th part message, which was in English, by the way, because the Japanese were making a statement for history and they didn't want any foul-ups in the translation. They were making a statement for history, attempting to justify what it was they were about to do. President Roosevelt read the 13th part, according to Commander Scholes, and declared this means war. He handed it to his number one confidant, Harry Hopkins, <coughs> who said the same thing. This turned the investigation on its head. From then on, investigators wanted to know, would it be possible for the commander-in-chief, the president of the United States, to read a secret dis dispatch from the enemy, declare this means war, and not immediately reach out for the head of his army and the head of his navy? So, let's take a look at the head of his army, General Marshall first. Marshall said he could not remember where he was Saturday night. December 6th, the night before the attack, nor could he remember where he was when he got the word Pearl Harbor was under attack. I'd like to contrast Marshall's answer with that of Churchill. <laughs> he was asked the same question, and he said he was at his country home in Checkers when he got the word Pearl Harbor was attacked, and satiated with satisfaction and emotion, he went to sleep and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. Of course, what I'm really interested in is the Chief of Naval Operations. Where was the Chief of Naval Operations the night before the attack when his only boss was reading a secret communication from the enemy and declaring this means war? Joint Congressional Committee asked Admiral Stark that. In January of 1946, Stark said he couldn't recall. Nobody reached him. They asked him the same question under oath the next day, same answer, couldn't recall where he was. The Joint Congressional Committee shut down ended their investigation. A week later, Admiral Stark's flag lieutenant, Harold Crick, came to Admiral Stark and said, Admiral, don't you remember where you were the night before Pearl Harbor? You were with me, sir. You were with me and our wives. We went to the National Theater. We, re we viewed the student prints. After the performance, we retired to your quarters. When we walked in the door, your houseboy said that the president had called you and wanted you to call him back right away. You excused yourself, went to, the li went to your library, came back a few minutes later and said you had been talking to the President of the United States about the critical situation in the Pacific. The Joint Congressional Committee asked uh, Captain Crick, uh, how come you can remember that and Admiral Stark cannot? Crick answered the obvious, you don't forget that sort of thing. The Joint Congressional Committee was compelled to reconvene their investigation. They took the testimony from Crick and then they followed that with another question to Admiral Stark. <clears throat> Admiral Stark stuck to his guns. Crick's memory refreshment notwithstanding, I do not remember that evening. <clears throat> One of Admiral Stark's aides was Vice Admiral William Smedberg III. This is from his published 1981 reminiscence. I, Admiral Smedberg, kept a wax cylinder record of everything President Roosevelt said to Admiral Stark. He would call up and say, Betty, a nickname for Admiral Stark, I want this done right away. And he'd give five or six things in rapid fire order. The Admiral would say, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President. Have you got that, Betty? Yes, Mr. President. And he'd hang up. The buzzer would ring in my office, and I'd go in to hear Admiral Stark say, Did you get all that, Smitty? Yes, sir. Well, get going on it. I, Admiral Smedberg, monitored nearly every conversation Admiral Stark had, and I made a record of almost all of them. Every now and then, when it was a personal thing, Admiral Stark would tell me to destroy the record. The Naval Court of Inquiry took testimony from Admiral Stark extensively. Naval Court of Inquiry's question number 388 to Admiral Stark. 
Did you, Admiral Stark, ever keep any, ever keep any record of your conversation with President Roosevelt during the year 1941? Admiral Stark's answer, no, I did not. Okay, at this point in my presentation, <clears throat> it's necessary for me to lighten up a little bit. I need to get a grip. Better yet, I like to seek the counsel from one of the greats, and who better to calm me down than the legendary Army football coach, Vince Lombardi. He summed up the matter perfectly. How's that again, Vince? I'm sure Admiral Kimmel was wondering the same thing. When he received the letter on December 12, 1944, from his only former uniform boss in the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stark, <clears throat> Admiral Kimmel wrote a draft letter, which he never sent. He started off by saying, I am I, Admiral Kimmel, and astounded that you, Admiral Stark, could and would write to me such a letter as that of yours of 12 December. And I can easily see why no one could have greater satisfaction than you upon the publication of the decision that there was no grounds for court-martial for Pearl Harbor. Then he continued, You, Admiral Stark, betrayed the men of the fleet by not giving them a fighting chance for their lives. You betrayed me by not giving me information you knew I was entitled to. You betrayed me by your acquiescence in the action taken on the request for my retirement. You betrayed yourself. You betrayed yourself by misleading the Roberts Commission as to what information had been sent to me. You betrayed yourself by your self-serving lapse of memory before the Naval Court of Inquiry. I hope that you never communicate with me again and that I never see or hear or see your name again, that my memory may not be refreshed of one so despicable as you. Okay, here's the way it works, folks. The President nominates and the Senate Armed Services Committee consents. That's the way it works. The chief sponsor of the 2000 law recommending that the President advance Admiral Kimmel on the retired list was Vice President Biden then a senator from Delaware. So, looking at the current political landscape, let me close with a moment of political whimsy. <laughs> Some people accuse me of being a one-issue man, but that's only because I am a one-issue man. If I had my way, Senator Lindsey Graham would be the Republican presidential candidate as he is on the Senate Armed Services Committee and has tried to help us out. But sadly, he's no longer running. Moving on, I note that Ted Cruz is also on the Senate Armed Services Committee, but I do not know his thoughts on the Kimmel matter, nor do I know those of Mr. Trump. Accordingly, and of course only speaking hypothetically, if the Democratic frontrunner, Hillary Clinton, becomes not a criminal, not a criminal, but a justice-involved individual, I'm riding with Biden. Incidentally, Amazon says this interesting-looking book will be available November 28th this year. Ladies and gentlemen, those conclude my remarks. I thank you very much for your kind attention. If you want to hear more of this, this is my speaking schedule for the remainder of the year and into the beginning of next year. Once again, thank you very much for your kind attention.
If anybody has any questions, we can put them right through the phone. Jim, you there? Yeah, yeah we're here. Uh, Shall I ask the audience a question? Absolutely. Who was responsible for the defense of the fleet when the fleet was in Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941? Awesome. We ready for the answer? I can't quite hear you, but here's the answer. Admiral Stark's testimony to the Naval Court of Inquiry. It is entirely clear that under the policies of many years and is laid down in the joint action of the Army and the Navy, 1935, the Army was fully responsible for the defense of Pearl Harbor against air attack that responsibility extended to ships within the Pearl Harbor area. Follow-up question, what did General Marshall say about that? <laughs> I can't hear you, so I'm just going to give you the answer. Marshall was short concerning the Army's responsibility for the defense of the fleet. The fullest protection of the fleet is the... Marshall's emphasis rather than a major consideration for us. Want another question? Go ahead. <laughs> Who is responsible for the defense <laughs> of the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001? And the question is, who is responsible in writing for the defense of the Pentagon on September 11, 2001? Here are your choices. <laughs> they can't pin that one on the Pacific Fleet Commander, I don't think. What's this? The answer is no one, uh, incidentally. <laughs> <clears throat> it fell through the crack. You're going to have to relay a question to me, Jim. I can't hear anything. No, that's okay. It was just a comment. I was, wow. Somebody said, wow. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> Nobody's responsible to the Pentagon. That's interesting. Nobody guarding the Pentagon. Well, nobody in writing was responsible for worrying the problem. And the 9-11 Commission never even asked the question. Forget New York. Defense of the Pentagon we're talking about. The question is, you're going to have to help me with that, Jim. I couldn't get it. Right. Does the Pentagon fall under the command of the N- it was military District of Washington. Military District of Washington. Well, the funny thing is uh, that, uh, uh, what it was it here? The Joint Forces Command uh, would have covered that area, but they had no responsibility for defending uh, the Pentagon. So you may recall, right after 9-11, one of the great uh, um, uh, changes was to develop the Northern Command. So today, Northern Command has got that responsibility. But that's really that. Go ahead. It's just a discussion going on about the chain of command. <clears throat> Anything else, Tom? Oh, well, I, I can ask your questions all night, but I, there's a lot more to what the, the Army part of this thing, too. But I, uh, how long I've been talking, I'm pushing an hour here. 
you know, one, I, I guess there's one question because it's not, we've got a recommendation, uh, you know, in front of the president to advance both Kimball and Short to the highest rank they held. What, what's the status of that? Where is that right now? What's holding up uh, reinstating them to their rank? Uh, well, that's a terrific question, and uh, I have a lot of answers to it. We'll start with this one. Uh, Commander Roger Scott was the Judge Advocate General of the Dorn Committee in 1995. He wrote a law review article for the Military Law Review in 1998, and his argument was, even admitting for the sake of argument all of the facts alleged in the Kimmel and Short cases, the more important consideration is unapologetically protection of the established scope of presidential power itself. <laughs> now, what does that mean? That means somehow that if uh, they offer a remedial, post posthumous remedial action for Kimmel and Short, somehow this is going to undermine the established scope of presidential power. This is the kind of thing that uh, we have to deal with, and I defy anybody to argue with what Scott said because it's virtually nonsensical. Here's well, another uh, reason why it hasn't been acted on. Uh, yeah. Former Chief of Naval Operations Jim Holloway III was at the National Press Club in 2004 when uh, uh, my uncle, uh, Professor Gannon, myself, uh, my cousin, gave a uh, press conference. And we thought we were given a doing a good job giving the press conference. And uh, Admiral Holloway was sitting in the audience, and when the question and answer period came out, he uh, decided he wanted to make a statement. He didn't have a question. He wanted to make a statement. So he got up and said, the reason that the president has not followed the Congress's recommendation to advance Kimmel and Short, it's totally political. We have to find a way that the president could make this judgment and politically benefit from it. Uh, as it turned out, the Naval History magazine glommed on to Holloway's comment and wrote a feature article about it, all about Holloway's comment, very little to do with the press conference. But uh, I think uh, Holloway hit the nail on the head here. Uh, in 1954, the Chief of Naval Personnel actually made a recommendation to the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Tom Gates, to advance Kimmel to make a federal uh, favorable recommendation for advancement. And Secretary Gates said no. No reason given. No need to give any reason. Admiral right. Rickover, he's had a good reason why they they didn't they haven't taken the action, remedial action for Kimmel is short. <clears throat> if you're gonna sin, sin against God, not the bureaucracy, God will forgive you, but the bureaucracy won't. I've always liked that one. This is one that I don't like much. Admiral Mitcher, I'm afraid too many people think like this. He was talking to his chief of staff, the famous Admiral Burke, about uh, Burke's uh, review of Admiral Spruance's not chasing the Japanese uh, in one of the South Pacific naval actions. Anyway, Michener tried to get Burke, his chief of staff, to change his report by, the, by saying this, you don't think the truth does more harm than good sometimes? Burke stuck to his guns. No, sir. Mitchner, well, it does. You and I have been in many battles, and we know there are always mistakes. <clears throat> this is probably my favorite for reasons why uh, they haven't taken the action. Princely self-esteem and institutional sclerosis prevented the Navy Department, and I might say the Army Department, from acknowledging misjudgments of their own. And then, of course, we got this bizarre situation where the Army Board for Correction of Military Records actually did recommend advancement, but uh, higher authority turned it down. <clears throat> I just like the argument about the presidential, you know, the, the, the presidential power. It's pretty interesting given that uh, the president has chosen more uh, declaration, uh, you know, to, to correct records, if you will, or declaration uh, posthumously. Uh, it, it's not too, you know, it's not too just in past, as I recall. There have been some awards of, uh, you know, I don't even think of the Medal of Honor Award, uh, at, at the, you know, at the behest of somebody to correct the injustice that was done in the past. So that, 
it's just interesting that they would be both sort of limited to presidential power uh, in, in that instance. So that's, uh, that's crazy. Oh. Yeah, I'm afraid I couldn't uh, couldn't get that very well. It was just a comment on presidential. The, the president recently awarded a medal of honor to someone who had been not properly awarded or had been mistaken or something. It's for to, civil war, actually. Yeah, civil war. Yeah, yeah. Civil war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh so yeah. I, uh, well, I tell you what, President Obama. You get a load of this. You may this group may particularly appreciate this. Are you familiar with the <clears throat> story of Major General John Lavelle, United States Air Force? I don't know if he's West Point or not. I should have looked that up. Maybe I will. Anyway, President Obama nominated uh, Major General Lavelle posthumously for advancement to four stars from two on the Air Force retired list because of declassified information, the Watergate tapes, showing that President Nixon had actually authorized General Lavelle to conduct Vietnam bombing missions of surface-to-air missile sites in North Vietnam. The nomination to restore Lavelle's four-star rank was recommended by the Air Force Board for Correction of Military Records, the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of the Air Force. Obama went ahead and made the nomination. But guess what? The Senate Armed Services Committee, then under Levine from Michigan and McCain from Arizona, declined to vote on the nomination, allowing it to expire the term of the Senate. So now, if uh, Obama was going to do this again, he'd have to renominate Lavelle. Yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. Great. Anybody have anything else? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. You bet. Thank you. It was great.